<laughs> Lord, we thank you that it's living and active, and Lord, I pray that you'd be speaking now. Lord, we ask that you would refocus our hearts and minds upon your word and what you would have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 9, Paul said that this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. This is the second time that Paul uses this phrase in the pastoral epistles out of the four times that he'll use it in the New Testament. And we looked at every single time that that phrase is used, every single time that Paul uses that phrase, it is always in accordance with salvation. It's always pointing to faith in Jesus. It is always pointing to how to be saved in the Christian walk. So this is a trustworthy saying, and this, is, this saying, whatever we're about to look at, is worthy of full acceptance because it's going to point to salvation. How somebody can be saved in, in Christ. In verse 10, for to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God. If the saying that brings people into fellowship with Jesus, it is so worth Paul's toil and striving. In fact, Paul will use that phrase multiple times as well. And every time he uses that phrase, it's always pointing to his labor in the gospel as he's bringing the gospel to Gentiles, as he's bringing the gospel to Jews, as he was doing everything that his life was commissioned to do. Paul is going to give his life, give his life, his literal head to the preaching of the gospel and the ministry that would go to the Gentiles into all nations. And Paul says that our hope is set on the living God. I mean, how foolish would Paul be if he spent all of that energy, all of that work, if God was dead? If God wasn't living? If the gospel he preached was just another religious form of trying to captivate minds or, or some sort of philosophy? But Paul believed and would always argue that the God that we worship, the God, is alive and is living and is executing his will and purposes on this earth. Not least of which is the gospel according to grace. Furthermore, Paul always had his hope in God. In fact, as we look at Paul's writings, he has hope in salvation. He has hope for the churches. In fact, he has hope for his own self. But that hope that he had for the churches, that hope that he had for salvation, that hope he had for his own life was always rooted in his understanding of how big and how glorious and how awesome the living God is. So nothing in Paul's life, no trial that would come, no sickness that would happen, no slander that would come against him, nothing he would do would ever, ever like lessen his hope because God was alive and he believed that. So the big question for us this morning, where is your hope? Do you have a hope in your paycheck that comes at the 1st and the 15th of every month? Do you have hope in family ties? In fact, you have hope in your own physical ability to accomplish because after all, that's how your career is being built. If I perform, if I achieve, that's my height of hope. My hope is myself because if I don't hope in myself, I go nowhere. Is your hope in your own personality or your positions? Paul made this very, very clear. He had a hope in the living God. So should our hope be. In fact, I would say, if you have a hope in anything other than God and his being alive, you're going to be very, very distraught in this life. Because the things of this world will give way. Money will dissipate. Friends will forsake you. Uh, connections will be broken. But a hope in God will always, always see you through the, 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 the thickest and the darkest clouds of this life. And for that, we praise God for but here's the big question. Some of you may be thinking, well, that's, that's cool. Yep, I have hope in God. I've been a Christian for 37 years. I've read my Bible 15 times over. Um, I believe that God is absolutely going to save my soul from hell and from the wrath of God. I hope that. I believe that. Awesome. But if you hope that, and you don't have a hope for something in the middle, how big really is your God? What do I mean? So many of us can check the block for the life after this with our hope. Man, God has saved me, and I believe that. But when things in this life begin to assail our lives, sicknesses, family issues, professional whatever, 
our hope begins a little like, wait a minute, what a, how can I fix this problem for myself? How can I figure this out on my own? How can I dispatch everything that I am as fully human to solve this issue? Let me see the best doctors. Let me talk to the best counselors. Let me figure this out so I can be okay because I'm going to trust me. If you're a Christian, it should always be, if I have a hope in a God who has saved me from the clutches of hell and the wrath of God, I certainly can have a hope in God for anything that this life would ever befall me. No matter what it is. No matter how great the cancer may be. Or the mother that's dying. Or the friend that has forsook you. Or the money that just keeps like leaving you for some reason. I don't know, I, I'm saving. Uh, I have college squared away now. I don't know where the money's going. Whatever temporal issue you have, a hope in God needs to be absolutely overriding it. Because you have a hope that God has actually saved you from himself and from his wrath. Praise God for that. And verse 10 also says, Who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe? We looked at this phrase back in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, the Christian faith, by the way, is a non-universal faith. Uh, Jesus himself would say in John 14, 6, that no one, zero, nobody, can come to the Father except through me. Except through me. So not all roads are going to lead to God. Jesus exclusively makes the claim, I am saving those who will come through me alone. As Christ, the Savior of the world. So there is no other Savior on this planet who has walked this planet who can literally save mankind from themselves. It's only Jesus. So the Christian faith isn't, hey, you're cool, I'm cool, you believe that, I'll believe that, I'll see you in heaven one day, it's going to be lit, can't wait to see you. No, we would appeal to what Jesus himself would say, that I am the only way to God himself. No other way. No other way. And Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, stood up in front of thousands of people in Acts chapter 4 and said, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men which we must be saved. God, no doubt, is the Savior of all people in that there is own one possibility for salvation, Christ. That's it. There's only one. It's only Jesus. But then he is certainly the savior of all of those who will believe in him. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says it clearly. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Therefore, Christ stands over this world as the only viable way in which people can be saved. And for those who believe in him, absolutely, he stands now over your life as the savior of your life. Which actually, for all of us here who are Christians, we should be rejoicing upon rejoicing upon rejoicing because every single sin you've ever committed, every single vile thought you ever had, has been completely nullified at the cross. Because he stands as the Savior over your life. And to him, you can look. And furthermore, because of that, we now get the ability, we now have the opportunity to do what? To point to the word as Luther did, and to point to the crucifixion, to point other people to Jesus. To point other people to Jesus, who is the Savior of all. In verse 11, Paul says to Timothy, command and teach these things. (laughs) Timothy, remember, was being sent to Ephesus to set things into order. So was Titus in Crete. And as these two young individuals, these two young men, these two young pastors, um, they no doubt had a a huge, uh, had a huge work in front of them. Uh, Everything was kind of out of whack in this first century church. Same with uh, Crete and what Titus was doing in the book of Titus. So Timothy had a position of authority because he was an overseer. He was an elder. He was a pastor of that church. In fact, not just that church. Many believe that Timothy oversaw multiple churches in Ephesus. And so Timothy 
under his leadership, under his pastoral authority, under the eldership that was him, he had a lot of weight of things to do in that region. And he had to have a posture of command and teaching because there, things were going wacko in Ephesus. Like weird personalities doing weird things. Strange teachings about higher learning and, and stay away from marriage and don't eat those foods and some sort of religious Gnosticism was creeping into the church. Timothy had to absolutely be a commanding individual in that moment because wolves were descending into the flock. Paul said that in Acts chapter 20. It already happened. The wolves had descended. In fact, as you have been with us, if you've been with us since the beginning of this uh, book six months ago, you may be thinking, wow, man, like, can we just get into a gospel? Uh, because, man, this pastoral epistle stuff is pretty heavy. There's a lot of commands. In fact, some of these commands are kind of negative. There's a lot of imperatives, and some of these imperatives are negative. Nevertheless, Paul is needing to correct, through Timothy, this fledgling church. Why? Because people were getting saved in Ephesus. Because people were coming into the flock. Because discipleship was happening, baptisms were going on, the Great Commission was being fulfilled. This needed to be a viable church for God to use in that region. Timothy needed to have a command presence and be able to teach these things. There is just a one small point I want to make here. Um, I'm going to call this the ministry of the word in correction. The ministry of the word in correction. And I'll give you some, some verses, and I'm going to apply this for us this morning. Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, and that it has this ability to cut through, through, through marrow and joints and soul and spirit. It literally has a, has a, has a filleting ability to it. 2 Timothy 4.2, Paul tells Timothy to preach the word, and in preaching the word, you are to reprove, you are to rebuke, you are to exhort. Second, uh, Second Timothy 3.16, all, all scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, and for correction. Ephesians 4.18, Paul was saying there's these crazy doctrines that were going on. People were being tossed to and fro with like wind, believing this, believing that. And Paul's going to say, you speak the truth in love. So the word of God in the life of the believer has an ability to correct other believers. And remember, we made this audacious claim that you don't need to be a pastor. You don't need to be an overseer. You don't need to be an elder to be one who is a minister. But we all of us are ministers of the gospel. And so as ministers of the gospel, we have the word of God to train us, to teach us, to exhort us, to grow us to mature in everything that Christ would have us do as ministers. However, we also have a role to play in one another's lives as Christians, which is to no doubt at times bring correction, to bring the word of God into the life of that individual and say, hey, I just have a question. You say these things. You're acting that way. You're doing those things. This is what the Bible says. I just would like to appeal to scripture in this moment and say, hey, I think you're wrong. Hey, help me understand. Give me, give me some, some sort of like, hey, why are you doing that? In fact, if the church understood how to do this in such a way of love, in such a way of grace, in such a way of truth, my goodness, we as, as a church would be growing and growing and growing as mature believers. Turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. It's just one book over. This is almost the zenith of why it's so important to see the word as a, as, as a ministry for correction in a way that is gracious and loving. Paul in 2 Timothy 2 was again telling Timothy how he can be a good minister, how he could grow in his faith and how he could do incredible things for the, for the kingdom as a pastor. Paul says, have nothing to do, verse 23, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. 
Verse 25, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to the, uh, to their senses and escape, this is crazy, from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Timothy was literally to go with the word of God, to correct his opponents, and a spirit of gentleness. Why? Because literally in so correcting error, in so correcting his opponents with the word of God, the authority of scripture, the Bible says that literally they would be able to be led back from their error and escape Satan himself. Satan himself. It blows my mind how so we have marginalized the work of Satan in the life of the church. In fact, we just looked at that last week that the, the overseer literally, is, it's two weeks ago, is in direct conflict with Lucifer. As if, as if to say the shepherd is literally standing against the assailing wolves. And so when the enemy does come into the body and does lead people astray, and they become opponents, and they become filled with all kinds of evil, we are to correct them in a spirit of gentleness because God may actually let them leave the clutches of Satan, and we would win them back. Let me just say this resoundingly again. We are all ministers of the gospel. I don't know what your sphere of influence is. I don't know what your family structure looks like. I don't know where you work. I don't know what uniform you may or may not wear. I don't know what training scenario you may be in. But we all of us have this very thing to do. Fathers, you are to lead your, hus- you're, you're to lead your households, your children, your wife in a way that is literally like this. Not that you're being bombastic with the word of God and submit to me, wife, and this is what the Bible says. But no, gently saying, sweetie, to your children, if you have daughters or little buddy or whatever you say, hey, this is why we don't do this because this is what the Bible teaches us. Um, We are to have all of us a ministry of word correction. Why? Because it may actually save those who are being led astray into error. But let me just say this though. This has been done so, so badly. This can be done in such a way that's like a Pharisee. Knocking on somebody's door and saying, I want to read some Bible verses to you because you just stink. Hear me roar. After all, I know what the Bible says and you don't. And I'm here to correct you. Are you kidding me? Uh, Paul just told Timothy, you need to do it in a spirit of gentleness and lowliness. And I would even add in humility. So that literally the person who's receiving that would understand what you're saying and be corrected in that way. And then Paul says in verse 12, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Timothy was a young man. He was, at this time, probably 30 to 35 years old. Let me just say something real quick about this young man, Timothy. He is my favorite Bible character in all of the Bible. Uh, I think there is a bad narrative going around about this young man, Timothy. Uh, I think a lot of commentators uh, that I've read have this idea that that Timothy was a timid individual. Poor, poor, poor young Timothy. You know, he needed a lot of that boys from Paul. Uh, he needed a lot of encouragement because, you know, he just, you know, he's just kind of young and cute and just not doing a really good job there in Ephesus. I just don't, I don't buy that narrative about Timothy. I mean, think about it. At the age of 16 years old, he actually circumcised himself to follow Paul. Uh, I don't know where you were at 16 years old, but I know when I was circumcised, and it wasn't at 16 years old in the first century with questionable anesthetic stuff. So Timothy, to me, is a very bold young man who's full of courage and has a special calling on his life to pastor and lead and teach the churches that he was called to do that in. And so I just don't see Timothy being timid. I don't see that in the pastoral epistles. I don't see that in his journeys with Paul. I don't see that all in the life of Timothy. I think this was a young man who had a very, very hard, hard work in front of him. As he was young, needing to correct. As he was young and needing to command. As he was young and needing to lead. As he was young and needing to be able to teach. That's a hard, hard task to have. But nevertheless, Timothy had it. But Paul makes this very interesting command over Timothy's life. And it is an imperative in the Greek. 
Paul is literally commanding Timothy, you absolutely let no one in Ephesus take advantage of you or despise you because you are young. Because you are young. You know, there are... If I were to ask you, what does racism mean? You may, be, you may say, well, I, I could give you a good definition. And you may define racism like this. Racism is prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against someone of a different race based on the belief that one's own race is superior. So if you look at another individual down because of the color of their skin or because of the race that they are, in your heart you have a racist heart. What about sexism? In fact, I think that definition for racism can be literally the same as sexism, just change some of the words a little bit. Prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against someone of a different sex based on the belief that your own sex is superior. Men are greater than women. Women, you absolutely are the weaker vessel. Therefore, because of that, I am greater than you. I am man. What about ageism? For me, that was a new word. In fact, ageism is leaping off the pages of Scripture right now at us. In fact, you could even put that very term in that same definition. Prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against someone of a different or younger age based on the belief that your own age, because you are older, is superior. Timothy, as a young pastor, needed to make it known that he not to be ta- he's not going to be taken advantage of because of his youthful or because of his 30-something age. Especially because there were, com- there were those who were older in the church who were coming out of the imperial guard coming into the churches in Ephesus. The question I have then is, has this ever happened in the church? Has racism ever happened in the church? Yes, it has. Is it happening today? Yes, it is. What about sexism? Oh my goodness. The past five years are loaded with scandals in the church because people thinking that somehow a woman is less than man. What about ageism? If somebody antagonistic against somebody because they are of a different age. Maybe their experiences or, or something is considered less than mine. Who are you to say that to me? Unfortunately, that is also rampant in the church. I, I'm just going to say this um, because it just, tr- it just happened. Um, as a young pastor myself, I can tell you already how many times I've heard from other individuals. I'm sorry, what did you say? You're the what? Yeah, I'm, uh, yep, I'm the senior pastor of that church, Calvary Chapel, Fayetteville. Come check us out. You're the senior pastor of that church? That's like if I were to be a black man and saying, hey, uh, I am the pastor of that church. You're the senior pastor of that church? Or maybe if a woman said, hey, I am the president of that school. And somebody were to say, you're the president of that school? How can you be? You're a woman. How can that be? You're black. How can that be? You're young. These types of subtle prejudices and discriminations and antagonism in our hearts have no place in the church. Zero. In fact, Timothy as a young man is literally having to assert his pastoral authority because nobody should disqualify Timothy in that region because he was a young man. And I just hate to say this, but it's the truth of Scripture. God has always used young men and women to accomplish his purposes. In fact, one of the greatest young men Paul or God ever used was David himself. Remember in 1 Samuel chapter 16, Samuel was told by the Lord, I have rejected Saul. I have rejected Saul. I'm not going to use him anymore. I'm not going to use him as a king. I'm done with him. I'm over it. And so go, go to Jesse and find for me the king of Israel. And so Samuel goes and speaks to Jesse and says, Hey, I'm Samuel. Hello. I'm here to find the king of Israel. I've been sent by you to you by God. Let me see your sons. And how many sons did Jesse have? He had seven. And all of a sudden, Jesse starts before Samuel showing him the list of the sons that he had. 
but none of them were gonna were gonna fit the bill. And 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 the Lord in First Samuel sixteen seven says this to Samuel. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. Speaking of one of Jesse's older sons. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Verse 11, then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And literally in that same chapter, you see David, this young sheep keeping shepherd guy, literally rise up to be the king of Israel and be anointed to do that. And then in the next chapter, you see the great narrative of Goliath and the courage and the boldness of this young man to take on the very enemy of Israel. The church has been completely filled with history of God using young men and young women to accomplish the the purposes of the church for the glory of God. And there's one young man I'd like to call your attention to this morning. Uh, He pastored a church at the age of 17 years old. 17 years old. 17 years old. And he recounts this story of him coming into the church and actually another pastor giving his kind of inaugural sermon over the church. And what he says and what he titles this sermon is absolutely incredible. It's the story of H.B. Charles. I don't even know who H.B. Charles is, but um, he was a pastor out in L.A. And now he's a pastor in, I believe, Jackson, Florida, Jacksonville, Florida. H.B. Charles records this. It was a great night of worship that I will remember for years to come. Evie Hill was one of the great preaching voices in L.A. when I was a boy. His radio broadcast came on every Sunday night before my father's broadcast. I had heard E.V. Hill preach many occasions before that night, and I would hear him many more times before he went on to be with the Lord. But the installation sermon, that is the sermon that was bringing in H.B. to his church, he preached that night remains the most memorable message I ever heard this dear man of God deliver. It was a message that has shaped my whole entire ministry. When he was finally ready to preach... Hill declared in his special way, I want to preach tonight from the subject, What Can That Boy Tell Me? For real? That was the title of his sermon. That's the question I have been hearing around this town of yours in L.A. from members of the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church. He said, What can that boy tell me when my marriage is in trouble? What can that boy tell me when I was having trouble with my children? What can that boy tell me when I was having trouble with my job? He's only 17 years old. He hasn't experienced anything yet. What can that boy tell me? After his introduction, the room was captivated. Where was this sermon going? (laughs) To be honest, I was a little nervous. I didn't know where the sermon was going either, but there was no need to worry. We literally laid back in our seats and was expecting the Lord to speak through this preacher. We were on a flight with a skilled and experienced pulpit pilot. Pastor Hill methodically worked through several passages of Scripture, arguing for the authority of God's Word from each one. After preaching for an hour, he climactically stated, So what can that boy tell me? He can tell you whatever the Word of God tells him to tell you. That message was a landmark for my life in ministry. It forged in me a confidence in the sufficiency of Scripture, even though I had not yet heard that doctrinal term. The sermon established my credibility with my congregation as I was a very young man taking leadership of a very established church. That message became a compass that pointed me to my very primary responsibility, which is to preach and teach the word of God. Here's the bottom line, H.B. says. Truth is truth. Whether I experience it or not, the Lord does not need my experience, experience to validate his own holy word. Regardless of age, Regardless of experience, does that individual know the word of God? Does that individual absolutely revere for what the scripture says of itself that it is? is? So age and things like this should never matter. In fact, Paul would remind Timothy that it absolutely shouldn't. And then Paul says, and I'll close here. But you, Timothy, set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. You, Timothy, not only command and teach, but you lead in a way that is primarily by example. Timothy, you are a young man 
who is literally being commanded to teach the word of God, to preach the word. And in so doing, you lead your life in a way that literally warrants example followership by the way that you speak, the way that you act, and the way that you love. By the way, all of those are qualifiable by eldership. All of those, by the way, are what an elder should be. A man who can be followed by conduct, speech, and his own love. So I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know your age. I don't know necessarily the, the, the demographic of this church. But I know this, that all of us as Christians have been given by God a commission to go into the world and to make disciples. No matter where you're at on the age spectrum, no matter where you're at in your walk with Christ, whether it's two years and you're 65 years old, or maybe it's been 15 years and you're 25 years old. Regardless, we all of us been literally given a commission to go out and literally preach the gospel in your families, in your neighborhoods, in your workplaces. You are a minister. And let nobody disqualify you because of something by age. And we even looked at how, unfortunately, uh, in the history of this own country, people have been disqualified because of their race or even because of their gender. That just shouldn't be. You are filled of the Holy Spirit to do great things for God. Let nobody discount you because of some sort of physical thing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we sought to finish chapter 4, but we did not. Lord, we are excited to get back into this chapter next week as we really look at more in more detail what it means to be a good minister of the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would, speaking to your church throughout this week, may your word, Lord, not fall on deaf ears. May your word continue to permeate this church. Lord, I ask that what was spoken and preached today, what was taught today, would be something to be chewing on all this week. Lord, I pray that you would erupt in this church just the understanding that all of us have been given a ministry. All of us have given a call. All of us have been charged by you, Jesus, to go out, to make disciples, to baptize believers, and to teach them everything that you've commanded, Jesus. Father, we, we follow you. We don't follow man, but we follow you. We worship you, Jesus. We don't worship the Bible. Just we worship you. But continue, Lord, to speak to us. Continue, Lord, to teach us Lord, continue to grow us as we look at your word, as we seek to be permeated by your word, Lord. Thank you for this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.